Hi, this is Anil Bharti, and today we are going to talk to uh, Jimio. Uh, they're a company that specializes in data lakes. And today we have with us uh, the CEO and co-founder of Jimio, Tomer Shrayan. So let's talk about uh, data lake. What is data lake? How would you define that? Yeah, so increasingly, uh, data lakes are um, a place where companies can can put a lot of their data and do it in a very cost efficient and scalable way. And when we think about data lakes in the cloud specifically, um, typically that data lives on things like S3 on AWS or ADLS, or sorry, S3 on, uh, on AWS and ADLS when it comes to Azure uh, usage. And so uh, companies can uh, ingest a lot of data uh, into these systems and then use a variety of tools and engines to, to process that data and it's very, very open and flexible and uh, scalable way to um, to do analysis on data very different from say kind of the traditional data warehouse approach which is very monolithic and you're locked into one vendor and you, know, you end up uh, spending a lot of money and having a hard time kind of using other technologies with that data today is where you know we do talk about monoliths a lot how can you explain that in the context of data we do understand in the context of infrastructure but in yeah. the context of data yeah, so if you think about it in the context of data, um, you have kind of two choices, right? You can, um, you can adopt a technology from, such as a data warehouse, um, where you kind of purchase that from a single vendor, and all the data kind of gets loaded into that system, um, can only be accessed through that interface, and you're basically paying that vendor anytime you want to access that data. And it becomes extremely difficult, as companies have learned over the last decade or so, uh, to actually get off of those systems when you want to. Um, so when we think about um, data lakes, the storage layer for, the, for those systems and the formats in which files are stored are open source and widely accessible. Um, so if you think about, for example, if you had a bunch of files um, on something like S3, right? Those files may be you know, text files, they could be JSON, they could be things like Parquet or, or C that are more uh, kind of performant columnar formats. But those formats are available and accessible to a variety of different technologies that want to access that data. And so as an example of that, um, when we think about Dremio as a data lake engine and customers using us to run SQL queries and uh, very high performance SQL queries on their data lake, they don't have to use Dremio. They can also use, uh, um, say, Spark to do data processing and ETL work on that exact same data. Um, and when they're doing that, they're not paying Dremio anything, right? So. It's that flexibility also to choose best of breed uh, kind of engines and services to, to work with your data as opposed to kind of making a commitment to just kind of a single vendor and a single stack. So where is the data coming from? Jeremy is a data lake engine, meaning mm -hmm. we, we sit on top of data lake storage and that could be S3, ADLS or HDFS. And we provide kind of that ability to, to do high performance uh, queries on that data directly. So you don't have to load it into a data warehouse and then ETL into, into you know, cubes or BI extracts or build aggregation tables to, to get the performance that you need. Um, and so the data that we deal with either originates inside of uh, uh, a data lake storage service, such as S3 or ADLS, or it's coming from some other, um, from some other system. So an example of that would be uh, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines uses Dremio and they use it on, on Azure and they ingest data from over 20 different systems, ranging from the reservation system to the casino system to um, you know, the, the, the activities on the mobile app. So really trying to, their, their goal is to understand, the, understand their customers so they can deliver better, a better experience uh, that's more tailored to individual customers. And, but the data is coming from a variety of systems, and what the data lake architecture enables them to do is very easily and quickly ingest all that data into a single place um, so they can make that data accessible to a wide variety of users, ranging from kind of BI users and, and analysts all the way to data scientists that are doing uh, various machine learning work. What are the platform or, you know, cloud or on-prem do you support where customers can run your uh, Dremio engine? Yeah, we actually support multiple environments. So you can actually run Dremio in the cloud, and you can also run it on-prem. Uh, I'd say the majority of uh, the companies we deal with now are using Dremio in the cloud. Um, and so that's either on Amazon or on Azure. Those are the kind of the two clouds that we uh, primarily work with. Mm -hmm. And who would be your typical customer? I think you mentioned one of the big names, but can you name some? Sure, it's companies uh, you know like Royal Caribbean and Microsoft. And, um, and it ranges from 
uh, you know, the largest kind of financial services firms uh, in the world to you know, the largest tech companies, for example, and, and everything in between, right? Uh, uh, a train company, um, one of the largest manufacturers of alcohol in the world. That's one of our favorite customers here. Um, so it's, uh, it's really a, a wide variety. And I think that's because every company now wants to be data driven, right? That's, mm-hmm. that's something that spans different industries. And most companies recognize that data is kind of their differentiating asset. That, that's what makes, gives them a competitive advantage is being able to take advantage of their own data. Um, and that's what, that's kind of their main asset. Um, and so Dremio is a really important piece for them in terms of being data driven, right? Because without this, there just is a ton of IT work that has to happen every time an analyst wants to do something with data, every time somebody wants to ask a question on that data. And once you have that kind of barrier where you're always, as an analyst, dependent on somebody else and you're waiting weeks or months to be able to run a query or, or get an answer, um, it becomes very hard to be data driven. And um, that, that's, I, I think that's why you see Dremio being adopted in all these different industries. Uh, can, can you be a successful company today without having a data-driven strategy? Because all the way from Tesla to Netflix or whatever it is, you, yeah. you, you know, that is you know, a critical piece, right? I mean, I, I, when I look at stuff around me, I don't see a single device that is either not collecting data or uh, analyzing it because without that, actually, it's purely useless device. I think that's increasingly the case, right? I mean, obviously there are, there are some kind of old, uh, old school companies that uh, aren't there yet, but, uh, but, but I think they're being disrupted because right. the, the competitive advantage that you have as a company, mm-hmm. if you can take advantage of that information is, is significant now. Right. So as companies go through this, you know, uh, buzzword, I mean, it's, it had been overly used, you know, digital transformation. Yeah. Uh, data is a critical piece of that, you know, because without that, you're still, I mean, you mentioned some airlines and all those companies, so you do need that. Uh, you know, retailers and you know, transportation companies, everything. And you see the same thing over and over again, right? Which mm-hmm. is um, digital transformation, which maybe is a fancy word mm-hmm. for saying kind of tech savvy, right? Mm-hmm. Ultimately comes down to being able to, to tap into, into data. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's very critical. I have two questions for you. First of all, uh, when did you find the company? And second was why? What problem you saw in the market mm-hmm. that you thought of solving that you created Dremio? So, yeah, I co-founded the company four years ago um, in the summer of 2015. And we actually spent the first two years in stealth just building the technology and building the engineering team. Um, there's a lot of IP to develop here to, to solve a problem like this. Um, and then after that, we, we actually had a, a product initially in beta and, and afterwards in uh, GA that we were offering to customers. And the, the reason for uh, starting the company really was, um, if, if, you, if you go back 10 years ago, right, that was about 2009 is when I joined a, another company called MapR, which was one of the mm-hmm. Hadoop companies. And at the time, Hadoop was, was really not something that enterprises or most companies had even heard of. Um, but it was... There was a lot of opportunity and potential there in terms of enabling companies to start taking advantage of their data. And the idea was, let's create a single place where you can dump all your data, and if, if you do that, things will be magical, right? You'll be able to do so many different things with that data. But the reality was that it ended up being just way too hard for companies to, to do that, um, to get the data in, to manage these environments, to take advantage of the data. And, and what you really saw is that mostly it was developers who were able to take advantage of it, but not the broader community of, say, analysts and, and other folks in the company. And so four years ago, um, we, my co-founder Jacques and I basically had the idea that, you know what, the, the goal of making, uh, making it possible to ask any question on any data at any time, no matter what system it in, it's in or how big it is, that's still the holy grail of analytics. That's what everybody wants. Um, but there has to be a different approach taken to solving it, one that's a lot easier, right? And, and, uh, um, and so we started thinking about what that would look like, and that, that was basically the, the foundation of Dremio. Um, and it only was, the, the only reason it was actually possible from a technology standpoint to even build something ambitious like this was a lot of the innovation that had happened over the, the few years leading to that in terms of open source, distributed systems, and, and also kind of the rise of the public cloud as well. And how important is open source to Dremio? Uh, open source is a critical part of, of what we do. Um, first of all, we use a lot of open source technologies in the product, uh, but we're also uh, creating various open source technologies. And 
In fact, one of the most significant ones is something called Apache Arrow. And that's a project that we created um, a few years ago. Basically, we took Dremio's memory format and we said, let's open source that uh, with the idea that, you know, if, if our own internal memory format would be an industry standard, um, that would be uh, that would make it really easy for us to integrate with extremely high performance with various systems. And so what has happened since then is that Aero um, uh, has become extremely popular. It's now downloaded over 4 million times a month. And it's the uh, really a foundational component for everything from, uh, you know, Python to R to MATLAB to Spark and you know, things in the cloud like BigQuery. So um, Aero is really used in, in probably over 100 different projects and technologies now. Um, and over 300 developers have contributed to it outside of Dremio. And that includes companies like Intel and NVIDIA and Google and others. And so that's been a big, uh, a big success for, for us. And it's allowed us to do things that otherwise would be impossible. And um, we've since extended that project with new technologies such as Gandiva, which is a compiler that we built to enable really high performance processing of, of Aero based memory and also Aero flight, which is a replacement for ODBC and JDBC which is hundreds of times faster. And so that allows movement of data uh, between systems uh, with really high performance. For example, if you're a data scientist and you use things like Pandas and TensorFlow um, and other things in the Python ecosystem, um, you can now populate a data frame um, in Python from a SQL query in Dremio, they, you know, performance levels that are uh, many orders of magnitude faster than what would have been possible through things like you know, JDBC or ODBC uh, to Dremio or, or to a you know a data warehouse, for example. So, and also today you are announcing this data lake engine. Uh, tell us a bit about it, what it is, and what are the highlights and new features. Sure. So we're we're announcing a data lake engine for both Amazon and Azure today, um, and the idea is really to make it possible for companies uh, to achieve really high performance queries directly on data lake storage. So things like S3, ADLS, and also HDFS, and and that way they don't have to. You don't have to load that data into a data warehouse and, and do all that kind of manual work and then load the data from there potentially into cubes and BI extracts and, and other things. Um, the, uh, the data lake engine also includes a semantic layer. So um, the semantic layer enables IT and data engineers to uh, apply security and also apply kind of business meaning to the data, but also allows the uh, consumers of data, such as the analysts, to curate new virtual data sets and to collaborate and share things. So we kind of think about it as the, the Google Docs for your data. And so those two things combined, along with the ability to join data, the, the data in your data lake storage with other sources, that's what we call the data lake engine. Um, the things that we've added in this release, um, uh, a number of them are related to kind of the performance and the ability to achieve that really, really fast performance on data lake storage. Uh, one of the key capabilities is something we call C3, which is a columnar cloud cache. It's basically a real-time distributed cache that gives you the ability to uh, utilize data, data lake storage with its infinite scalability and extremely low cost, but to, a, to do that with a performance of NVMe. Um, and so as data is being accessed uh, by the engine, uh, different pieces of it are being cached locally on the Dremio cluster. And that's entirely transparent and without any involvement or cost uh, to, to the user, to the customer. Um, and that C3 cache then enables you to get the performance that you get with uh, local SSDs or NVMe uh, while you're basically interacting with uh, something like S3 or, or ADLS. We also added another capability called predictive pipelining, which is focused on accelerating the first access to that data. So the first time we access something from S3, it's not in the cache, right? And um, in order to accelerate that, what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that the engine can take full advantage of the network speed um, that's available inside of that cloud, inside of that region. Um, and the way to do that is to really kind of predict what is that next set of things that the engine needs to access so that you're never kind of waiting for 100 milliseconds or a few hundred milliseconds for the data to come back. You're actually kind of predicting what is the next set of bytes or next set of columns or fields that are needed and fetching that one second in advance um, into the engine so that you can constantly kind of keep that throughput going um, at wire speed. And so those two things combined make it uh, possible for the first time now to really take advantage of data lake storage um, with the performance that you expect from 
kind of local storage or a, a high performance data warehouse. Excellent. Uh, Tomar, thank you so much for not only explaining the whole data lake landscape, but also uh, talking about the today's announcement. And I look forward to talking to you again in future to for the next announcement that is coming on Dreamio. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me here.